Mark, the gospel, chapter 11. I'm going to be reading verses 12 through 14 and verses 20 through 22. The Bible says that, And on the morrow when they, Jesus, and his disciples were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he, again Jesus, came, if happily, if by chance he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, when he arrived at that fig tree, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered, though the tree never spoke, or yet had it by evidence of its fruit, Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it, a very important denoting in the scripture. They heard what he said, and it would have significance in just a few moments. Verse 20, And in the morning the next day, as they passed by that very same way, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, as they passed by this next morning, he called to remembrance, saying unto Jesus, Master, behold, the fig tree which you had cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. It wasn't necessarily about whether or not there was fruit. There was a deeper lesson of faith to be learned from this object lesson that Jesus had just demonstrated over the past 24 hours. And I would like to talk to us over the next little bit on this subject this morning. Have faith. Have faith, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Have faith. Say, well, pastor, I have faith. And I would say back to you, have faith. Have faith. There are four foundational words that are just as critical to our Christian faith today as they were on the first day that they had ever been expressed. We know it, we've quoted it, perhaps we've read it over and over again throughout the years, or maybe we've not ever begun in that first chapter of Genesis, in that very first verse. But the Bible records those four critical words, in the beginning God. And I would submit today, not just to this audience, but to our world in which we live, that if we struggle in any way to believe this first scriptural sentence and its beginning words, then we will spiritually be off balance as we continue in our Christian walk. We are living in a world today that is increasingly opposed to these first four words. A world that is working overtime to evangelize the inhabitants thereof, trying to make converts against this reality and this statement of faith that in the beginning God. We understand that it is so critical to our importance that we realize or critical to our walk and important that we realize that in the beginning God and that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. In the beginning God, he was all alone creator. In the beginning God was sovereign. In the beginning God was omnipotent. In the beginning God was omniscient. In the beginning, God was all powerful. In the beginning, God, in the beginning, God, and I will say today that God still remains in that very first place, for He has no beginning and no end. He is the Alpha and He is the Omega.
Omega. He is the first and he is the last and everything in between. We today more than ever before in the world in which we live, we must have an anchored trust and a secure confidence in these four life altering and world creating words in the beginning God. And we cannot accept this as true without a fundamental ingredient called faith. If, if you and I were to again, if we were to omit faith from all that we understand as Christians today, we would be left void on every front. Without faith, there would be no salvation. It takes faith to believe that there are kingdoms and mansions being prepared for you and I. It takes faith to believe that there is life after this life and that there is life that will live on and last eternally. It takes faith to believe that all things are going to become new. It takes faith to believe that his blood washes away and eradicates our sins. It takes faith to receive and believe that he has poured out his spirit upon all flesh. And it takes faith to be a recipient of that Holy Spirit gift that God wants and desires every individual to possess. It takes faith to believe for a miracle. If you take faith out of the equation, the Bible would be void of all accounts of the miraculous. It takes faith to believe in healing it takes faith to believe that God is it takes faith this ingredient is fundamental to the very reason why we have gathered here today it takes faith to worship an invisible God it takes faith to read and believe every promise that has been recorded and been delivered to us as his children and one of those seven key areas that we must intentionally I, I feel such an urgency this morning perhaps some of you have already tuned me out or tuned into another frequency because you, you, you heard faith and, and it's like okay I've got that down but, but I feel an urgency in my spirit in this day and hour that the people of God the chosen of God those known and identified by our faith in God that we must have faith in God like we have never had faith in God and we are facing opposition that would want to steal and strip that faith away from us. We must intentionally strive to release more and more this year of the faith that is within us. The Bible tells us again, we, we go back to the beginning. If we struggle within the beginning God, then we're going to be off balance in everything I say from this point going forward or that we read from that point going forward in the book, the good book of God. Hebrews 11.3, the Bible tells us that through faith we understand because faith brings illumination. Faith will give us an understanding that is secure. We understand that the worlds were framed or perfectly joined together by the word of God. When you look out into that that vast endless sky and we look up to what we call space and we see the planets and we see the world and the earth and the sun and the moon we understand through faith that the worlds were created or framed and joined together by the word of God so that everything you and I see with the human eye was not made by those things that can be seen but rather those things that are invisible every single thing that we see and lay hold of with the human eye again was spoken into existence by invisible words that you and I have never heard to think of the reality that the word of God is holding this entire universe and universe is unknown holding every 
thing together. It is literally mind-blowing and difficult to, to fathom and understand. The totality of God's creation. And all that was set in motion and remains to this very day was first spoken into existence. And it is all summed up in the eight times in Genesis 1 that God said. Everything that you and I know today was summed up in eight statements that begin with God said. From the light until the Logos of the first created human being eight times is the only way or the only uh, amount of times that God had to speak to put it all in place and set it all in motion. We realize that all things are being upheld by the power or the word of his power. So I would ask you and I today, bringing it down to a more personal application, what does your world look like this morning? We understand that the worlds are being held together by His Word, the Word of His power. What does our individual world look like today? And I would ask a subsequent question, what or who is holding your world and mine together? What's holding your world together? We, we understand here practically that there are many people that fall, feel like their world is falling apart today. We, we, we understand in society that people, their world is void and without form. They're searching, they're seeking. There's an empty vacuum inside that they're seeking to fill in every desperate way possible. And they feel again as though their world is shattering or crumbling or falling apart. What is holding our world together? You see, what we've got to realize today is that faith is a gift from God that is given to every single individual. It is a necessary component of our relationship with Him. D.L. Moody said it like this, Faith takes God without any ifs. Corey Tin Boone said that faith is the radar that sees through the fog. I'm talking this morning about having faith. Faith is the eye that can see the invisible and the hand that can touch the intangible. I'm talking about faith. What's holding your world together? What does your world and mine look like today? To think for a moment that God would sow into you and I his creation, that which he formed and breathed life into, that when he breathed the breath of life, in that breath there was the sow of a seed that had the capacity and would grant you and I the capacity to access all that he is and all that he is able to do. Because that is what faith is, my brothers and sisters today. It is that all access pass that opens unto us the realm of the supernatural. It gives us access to everything that is stored up in the storehouses of God in the heavenlies. Everything that he is, is made available to us by faith. And God plants in us. In seed form, the ability to tap into that same creative power that was set in motion, that shaped and continues to support the very world we live in today. Romans 12 and 3 tells us, it says that God hath dealt or sowed into every man the measure of faith, the measure of faith. Again, it is necessary, it is, it is vital, it is critical to our relationship with God. I would, I would say to us in this year 20 and 23 that our faith is more powerful than what we realized this morning. More powerful than what we realized this morning. According to Jesus, if I read the book correctly, that he said that our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. 
Our faith is the victory. So this overcoming victory, if you can say it like this, the overcoming victory has been given in measure to every single person so that every single one of us has the ability to overcome and be victorious in spite of what we find ourselves facing because God put that ability to overcome inside of us. Why? Because He is the victor and He has overcome the world therefore be of good cheer because God has also given us access to that winner's circle if you will. I, I want to show you this morning through the word and, and application I want to show you how powerful faith is. This is what faith did. Not with guns and bows and arrows not armies and bullets and not all kinds of other inventions but this is what faith has done. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, who through faith, watch what faith did. Faith subdued kingdoms. Now, now when we think of what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and the aligning of China, we're, we're thinking nuclear, we're thinking military alliance, we're thinking a billion man army in the Chinese, we're thinking all of these things, but the Bible says that faith subdued kingdoms. It says that faith obtained promises. I'm telling you, we don't realize how powerful it is, that very ingredient we possess. It was faith that stopped the mouths of lions. It wasn't lion tamers. It wasn't leashes. It wasn't chains. It was faith that shut the mouth of the lions, not just in Daniel's den. There was an angel there with Daniel, but faith would shut the mouth of lions. Faith had the power to quench the violence of fire. Faith can put fire out. If your world is burning, your world is on fire, faith has the ability to quench that fire. Faith has the ability to escape the edge of the sword. Faith will deliver you. Faith has the ability to deliver and turn back the sword that would take your life and slay you. Faith had the ability to cause them to wax valiant in fight, to make them victorious. Faith did all of this. Faith did all of this. Faith turned to flight the army of the aliens. It was faith that had the ability to turn back. Could you imagine going to war with Russia and China and standing there and trusting in faith to turn these armies back? But it was faith, the Bible tells us. That is how powerful faith is. And we think sometimes that, that faith is, is believing in a moment. That faith somehow is being inspired for a few instances and speaking a few little words. But I'm telling you what God has given us in seed form that takes strength and it takes effort and it takes ability. I'm telling you God gives it in seed form so that his creation can work it can work it and we 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 as a people we as christians we we understand that 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 our salvation is not of works lest any man should boast but it is not that we are not required to work the very resources or the very ingredients that god has given to us and we don't like that word work we don't we as people, all of us, I don't mean we P-O-M, I'm talking about we don't like that word work. We like the word free. We, we like the word free. We, we like the word instantaneous. We like the word magical. We, we like the word genie in a box. We like where we come in and it's just given to us because we feel a sense of of entitlement, but we don't like that word work, and faith is given to us in seed form, and if you know anything about seed, it doesn't just sprout on its own. There's a lot of labor, there's a lot of work involved in getting the most out of that seed, and I want to say that for every one of us today, that our faith is not limited. There is absolutely, positively nothing that limits our faith besides us and our understanding of how powerful faith is. There is unoccupied space for an expanded effectiveness and empowerment of our faith. 
It, it, uh, oh, there's so much that that that, like, I, that I can say here, but 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 it, it, it's like there there are no tenants. It's unoccupied real estate. Faith is endless. It, it was in an interview where Kevin O'Leary was was asked by Tucker Carlson. He said, "What's going to happen to all of those high-rise buildings on Sixth Avenue in in New York City because the people are not coming back to work? What are they going to do?" With with all of that unoccupied real estate, those those story after story of floors and, and thousands upon hundreds of thousands of square foot of real estate in what once was the prime real estate in this country. And it's sitting unoccupied, much like in many instances our faith does. You see, we 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 we, we often we, we miss the principle except for what we, we, we put it in in terms of its. We read a scripture, we see a principle, and we leave it right there. Give, Luke 6. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But, but, but there's a principle there. That is not limited, that is not limited just to finances or judgment or mercy or love. It is a principle of God. And watch what it continues to say, that with the same measure that you meted out, it shall be measured to you again. And I would submit to us that it is the same with our faith. We have been given a measure of faith. And as we release that faith, according to the measure of faith we release, we're going to get back a good portion, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But we have first got to measure out that faith. We've got to release that faith. And again, it's not limited to just a service. It's not limited to just a prayer or a prayer meeting. It is an absolute mindset of lifestyle. Faith, faith. And so the apostles, upon Jesus, giving them a fresh revelation, they were overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed when he said to them, well, they said, Master or Lord, how many times do we forgive our brother? Seven times. And when he said 70 times seven, their faith was overwhelmed. And in that moment where their faith was overwhelmed, they realized that this was not a limitation, but an opportunity for increase and expansion. And they said unto him, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Now, now I, I, I don't believe that, that their faces, their countenance, their, their body language was like defeated. You know, Lord, oh man, I... This is this is just this is this is too much. It's it's just overwhelming. Oh, increase our faith. You know, like like this is an impossibility. No. I believe that they were excited. I believe that there was anticipation. I believe they were like, Lord, we can do this. This is possible. God, increase our faith. We want to live like this. We want to we want to follow you like increase our faith. What would happen if if the posture and the mindset and the outlook of which we approached our faith said, Lord, increase our faith. When was the last time we prayed, God increase our faith? Whatever measure we release is coming back. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. <laughs> when, whenever, if, if you've ever dealt with a, if you've ever dealt with a credit card company, and, and you've lost something, or or they want to verify or authenticate your account, you get them on the phone. One of the things that they'll say to you is this: Can you tell us some of the last places that you spent or used your credit card? Because they want to authenticate that you are the owner of that particular account. I would ask you, when was the last time, or what was the last transaction of purchase with your faith? What was the last thing your faith purchased in your life? To authenticate that it's your faith. Can we go back and say, the last thing my faith purchased was this. On such and such a day, I pumped gas at this station in this city or this state. That's the last time I used my card. When was the last time? 
that our faith made a purchase on our behalf. I'm, tr- I'm telling you, there is so much more than to this than what we understand. Our faith can be exercised and should be exercised. Our faith can be stretched and it can and should be nourished. It was given to us in a single measure, in a single unit, but it was intended to expand and overtake our entire lives. But there are those times, my brothers and sisters, where we must go to God, where things are so overwhelming, where things seem so beyond our human ability, where things seem so impossible, where we must go to God and pray with divine desperation for an expansion and a spiritual acceleration of that which he has sowed in us in seed form. And I'm telling you, this day and hour in which we live, we need a faith that grows from a mustard seed into a tree. We need to say, God, it's overwhelming. God, what I'm facing, I I don't even know how I can humanly possibly understand and apply this in my life. But God, increase my faith. Increase my faith. In simplistic application, we, we place faith or have faith in those that we know have the ability we, we assess, we, 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 we calculate, we, we survey, and we, we assess and come up with the conclusion that a situation or a person or a source has the ability to help us, to provide for us, to, to come through in some way for you and I when we face an impossible challenge or we we face an impasse we we assess if you will the track record or the proven history of an individual or an institution to determine what level our faith will operate on we determine what level our faith is going to operate on And more frequently and easily than we realize we put our faith in people And we put our faith in man-made inventions and solutions. And we put our faith in in, in terms of the faith in us. We put ourselves in situations in which we have little or no control. And yet we have faith. Now I've used this before. But it's still recent and it's still relevant. We literally were in Dallas this week. And we went back to the surgeons and back for Sister Melinda's follow-ups. And we're sitting there with doctors and they spend 15, 20, 30 minutes with you, complete and utter strangers. And they they assess and we have the utmost confidence, even though we try to be very astute and be good be good stewards of the knowledge that we do have. And they they turn around and, and they wield Allison and Sister Melinda in. We we don't know these people from a hole in the wall. Wheel them in. And we have faith that what they say they're going to do in that OR, they're actually going to do. Could you imagine the faith to say, first take out my two existing kidneys and trust by faith that two days later I'm going to get another one. If in fact I don't, I die. But by faith, by faith this week to change medication. By, by, by faith, they, they, just, they just take the pen in and they write the script. I went to the cardiologist two Mondays ago and, 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 and he wanted to give me a new medicine. I didn't want to take the new medicine. I, I don't want to take the medicine. And, and so I said, look, I, I'm, I, I'm not trying to, to challenge your, your, your knowledge or your education, but, but I, I just don't feel comfortable with this. But inevitably, I, I by faith, I submitted to the individual's subscription of what will be the best long term for my health. But I never met this man in my life. And so by faith, I go and fill the prescription and begin ingesting a medication that he's telling me is going to help me and is going to work. By faith, each two weeks, they call Sister Melinda and change this medication, and we do it. Air travel. I mean, I I, I sat on the plane again this week. I I just never get over this because I'm not a fan of flying. And I'm like, I'm sitting on this, 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 uh, I don't know how many thousands of pounds this thing is, and and, and I'm surveying everything I possibly can survey, and, and I'm assessing, and I'm trying to take it all in, and I'm putting my life and my family into the hands of a complete stranger to get this, 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 
this, this, this school bus or whatever you want to equate it to to get this thing off the ground and get me back down on the ground safely. And we believe, we believe. We believe, Amanda, you're going to go have a biopsy. I don't, do you know these people? Do, have you met them? Have you been to their house, celebrated holidays? You know, are you going to ask for, for the individual's credentials, his records from school, whether or not he passed with, with, a, with a D minus or whether or not he was an A plus, but they're going to somehow, we're trusting them to somehow perform a procedure on us and by faith we're believing in what they profess. And I'm telling you today, we believe they have knowledge we believe experience and answers and expertise to help us and heal us and keep us safe but we have no idea and Jesus said he said that with men this is impossible but with God all things are possible I'm here to tell you we've got to have faith like we've never had faith before the important thing Oral Roberts said, is not the size of your faith, it's the one behind your faith. It's the one behind our faith. And can I tell you, the one behind our faith is flawless. His record is sterling. His character, his nature, his expertise, his wisdom, his past track record. He is absolutely perfect in every way so why would we not have a full faith in God faith in God it is the prerequisite in fact to approaching him we, we can't even approach God. This is why I go back and say it's critical to our Christian walk. Because if we don't have faith in God and believe that in the beginning God, then we can't even approach God. We can't even approach him. We can't please him. We'll never experience intimacy with him outside of faith. And we'll never depend on him. And that's a word, again, we don't care for as human beings. But can I tell you that God looks and desires for there to be a codependency between he and his creation? That God, in a very healthy and divine way, he wants you and I to be codependent upon him. Not self-reliant, not self-sufficient, not self-made, not self-helped. God wants there to be a, a dependency upon him. But we can't depend upon him and lean on his arm apart from having faith. For it is without faith, the writer said, it is impossible to please him. It's impossible. There's no way possible. There's no way apart from faith. But when we come to God, we must believe that he is. We must have faith and believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And can I just tell you, and I, I love this, I find great inspiration in this, and I pray you will too, that if God ever did it before, that God can absolutely, positively do it again. If he ever did it in a yesterday, in a far off yesterday, then God can absolutely do it today. If he ever did it for an individual, a human being, whether they are, were alive 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, or they'll be born tomorrow, if God ever did it for one, he can do it for all. He can still he can still shut the mouths of lions. He he can still quench the violence of fire. God can still do it today. So why do we sometimes struggle to believe or to have faith? God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. And one of the things I love is that God doesn't need a precedent to be set in order to perform his will, his will or his or to demonstrate his power. God God is the God sets his own precedent. God, God doesn't need someone. Nobody could ever do anything that God hasn't already done. God sets his own precedent. So I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you, where, where you find yourself today. I don't know what you feel like you're up against. I don't know what's overwhelming you. But can I tell you that in the word of God, there is precedence. In the word of God, there is somebody that God has healed. There is someone that God has delivered. There is someone that God has spoken to. If God ever spoke orderly, 
audibly to one. He could speak audibly to you. Can I tell you, if one ever saw an angel, you could see an angel to anything that is in the Word and that has ever been done by God, He can do again. There's only two things that God does not know and that God cannot do. Number one, the only thing that God does not know, and that's another God. He said, is there any other, Lord, any other God besides me? He said, no, I know not any. And if God don't know of any other God, there is no other God that exists. He knows no other God. <laughs> and the second thing is that the only other thing that God cannot do is fail. God can't fail. He cannot ever fail. He cannot ever fail. The question is not whether or not God fails or succeeds. It's a matter of whether or not we have faith to trust and faith to believe that if God ever did it, He can do it again. Why would we put ourselves in the situations we do and have faith to believe that it's going to instantaneously and automatically happen? But when it comes to life and circumstances and challenges and hurdles and limitations in this life that we somehow struggle to believe that the God who set it all in motion is going to be strong held is going to be strapped down from coming to our rescue with God nothing nothing shall be impossible one said it like this that faith counts things done before God ever acts before God ever acts counting it done and there is no question again that there is is and our faith is under attack today it's critical because if you lose faith you lose hope if you lose hope you lose heart if we lose heart we lose life when we when we are so weighed down and the enemy knows he knows in a generation like never before in this country that is questioning the existence of God that is withering from the worship of God he knows attack their faith somehow convince them to believe that God is not God that somehow God is not able to rescue that God is not able to deliver that God is not able to provide that God is not able to save because in stalling or stopping our faith from operating he prevents us from accessing all that God is and all that God possesses the power to perform in our lives it's just it's just that simple it's just that simple Spurgeon said it like this whether or not we like it asking is the rule of the kingdom it's the rule of the kingdom Nothing happens until we speak. Nothing happens until we express our faith. He said, let him ask in faith. This is James. Let him ask in faith. It's not enough to ask. And I think sometimes this is where we, we miss the exchange. It's not enough just to ask. God, would you please heal me? God, would you please do? It's not enough to ask. We can say the words, but he said we've got to ask in faith, nothing wavering. How often do we do that? See, because here's what's happening. We're looking with the eye at what we're facing. We're looking at the eye with what we're up against. We're looking at the eye with the eye of, at our surroundings and our circumstances. And then with the mouth, we're trying to proclaim or declare faith. And the two are in conflict. I'm speaking it, but what I'm seeing is telling me a different story. But that is why the, Paul said we walk by faith and not by sight. Because sight will cause our faith to stumble. And so we waver. Not that we want to waver. We want to believe. We're fighting to believe. But what we're feeling, what we're seeing, what's going on and unfolding around us is somehow causing there to be a wavering of our faith. And what James said is, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Because it's not enough 
to ask. I'm telling you today, we've got to find and we've got to possess faith like never before. But it takes work. We've got to exercise it and be intentional because what causes our faith to waver are the natural things, not the spiritual things. I don't believe that our faith wavers in the fa- infallibility of God's word, the immutability of God's word. It is the natural occurrences in our everyday world that mess with and cause our faith to waver, like time and the delay thereof. Well, God, I, I, I mean, I've been praying it since January 1st, and it hasn't happened yet. So God, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, uh, we asked it in faith, but now now we're kind of a little off balance. We're, we're wavering a little bit. Why? Because time has delayed and we've not yet seen our answer. We've not yet laid hold of the solution or the, the reward of the promise. Impulsivity and impatience. Oh, that we would kill our impatience. I wonder what our, inca- our impatience kills in our faith versus our being willing to kill our impatience. We are so impatient. We are so impatient. When we finally ask, when we finally muster up the faith to make that request and speak it, then all of a sudden we are so impatient upon waiting for God to respond. Paul said it like this, don't cast away your confidence, which has a great recompense or repayment of reward. This is what Paul said, you have need of patience. That after you've done the will of God, can I tell you, the will of God is to ask in faith. The will of God is for there to be a release this year. The will of God is for there to be a recovering of all this year. The will of God is what we've been proclaiming this year. That is the will of God. But he said, don't cast away your confidence. He said, because after you've done the will of God, you've got to have patience that you might receive the promise. How many of the promises that God is in process of sending our way are forfeited because we walk away prematurely in impatience? And we question, have I done the will of God? Was that really the will of God? Was that really prophetic? Is that really, is that, is, is that seven year stuff really, really make a difference? It, it, it sounded good. It sounded good, Brother Wilson, a few, few weeks back in the moment. It's, it sounded right. I, I, I understood it, but, but, but was that the will of God? And what happens is our impatience and the inner voices and the doubt that creeps in causes us to abort, if you will, at times the promise that God is in the process of preparing for us. It's so powerful to me. We've got to have faith. There's an urgency in the spirit that I feel. We've got to have faith like never before. And so they're, they're walking and they're on their way to the temple and Jesus is going to get there. He's going to kick the tables over. He's going to break his whip out. He, he's, going to just, he's going to just throw a fit in the temple that, 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 that this very day. And on his way there, he looks at this tree and what he discovers does not meet his natural expectations. He was hungry as a man. And he understood that they realized that they realized that he that 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 that, that it wasn't the time uh, uh, for figs. His disciples, Mark knew this just wasn't the time for figs, and it's almost like Mark was perplexed. Why was he expecting to find anything? It was only time for leaves, not for fruit. But Jesus had an expectation that this tree that he created was going to respond according to his desires and according to his natural. expectations expectations and when it didn't he cursed it and he said unto the tree let no man eat fruit of you and his disciples heard it and what I love what I love and what we often miss is is, is not necessarily that the, the, that what he spoke in cursing the tree and the drying up from the roots but this very thing that the power of the spoken word it truly is ever so powerful and we often don't realize it because it's not just powerful in proclaiming and declaring what we want to see God do we have to often realize and we don't that there is power in our cursing when God doesn't do it according to our expectations 
Now, we wouldn't categorize that as cursing. Jesus didn't use any foul language. He just simply said, let no man eat of you. And there is death and life in the power of the tongue. Whether we mean to speak it and declare it or not. See, we, I speak life. And we think, okay, we spoke life. But then when we start to become impatient, and we start to doubt, and we start to murmur, and we start to say all the things that we thoughtless, thoughtlessly allow to come out of our mouth, we don't even realize that we are speaking curses over the very promises that we are proclaiming. And Jesus turns to them in that moment, and he said, have faith in God. And what he's saying is, have faith. In this power of the spoken word. Have faith that when I speak it, it's going to happen. Have faith that what you speak, you're going to see. He said, if you've got faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, that mountain must obey you. That sycamore tree must stand to attention when you speak. And this is the faith that he is talking about. As you get ready, as the praise team comes, it is this faith that he's talking about in the spoken word and the expectation on that which is spoken to come to fruition. It's so powerful. Our faith, or lack thereof, fuels our speech. He said, if you say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be cast into the sea. This is right after. So he tells them, have faith. Peter remembers, wait, Lord, you you, you spoke this yesterday. Look at the tree. He said, okay, have faith, Peter. Have faith in God. And now he gives them another illustration. He said, if you speak to this mountain and tell it to be removed and cast in the sea, but watch, and shall not doubt. There's that doubt that is ever wanting to creep in. If you don't doubt in your heart, but shall believe Those things which he says shall come to pass. See, this is where I feel like we, we, myself, we, we, we miss it. We say it in inspiration, but we don't believe that it's going to come to pass. We've got to start declaring. We've got to start speaking with a belief and an understanding that it is going to come to pass. He said, if you speak it and you believe it, then you will have whatsoever You say, then you will say. So the first thing as we get ready to close is this. We're often slack in the same. We often don't say. We don't declare each day. We don't always profess and boldly pronounce what we believe God is going to do. But can I tell you that faith will never rise above its confession. We've got to confess what faith has the power to do. The second thing is, is that often we have a case of spiritual myopia. Myopia is blindness. We have a clear focus when it comes to identifying the hurdles and the obstacles and the overwhelm, uh, the overwhelming emotions that we feel and the difficulties we face. But we have blurred vision and we have a distorted view of the power and the provision and the protection and the promises that God is able to perform in our lives. We can see so easily why it will never happen. We can, we can define so quickly why it's going to be difficult for God to somehow work in our lives. That He would ever allow us into a situation that He couldn't rescue us from. And the second issue is that we as individuals, as people, as human creation... We are so emotionally driven that we struggle to believe that what we declare will actually materialize. If we're just honest, we we struggle to believe it's actually going to materialize. Even when we can declare it, that doubt, it kind of counteracts the faith that we muster up. We know that faith comes by hearing, yet by the same means, so does fear come. It comes by hearing comes by hearing. Jarius' daughter, she's at the point of death. And he comes to Jesus. His faith brings him before Jesus. And this is what he says to him. He's making declaration now. He's speaking in faith. I pray, come and lay 
your hands on my daughter. She's dying, but come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed. And watch, she shall live. He's not doubting. He's declaring, no doubt. He's asking in faith, Lord, you come to my house. You lay your hands on my daughter. I don't care that she's dying or not. You lay hands on her. She will be healed and she will live. But watch. He gets interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood. He circles back. And while they're in the midst of that miracle unfolding, while Jesus is speaking with her, the woman with the issue, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a servant which said, same means, the same spoken expression, said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the master any further? What's the point? It was a good ask in faith. You declared it. You, 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 you did great in having faith to believe God can do it. But what's the point now? Because in the natural, it's over. Don't bother him anymore. And Jesus heard the word that was spoken. Because again, I'm going to reemphasize, he hears the proclamations of faith, but he also hears the proclamations of doubt. He hears the blessings and the asking in faith, and he hears the cursing. I don't mean language. I mean just the denial of God's ability. He hears it. And this is what he said to the ruler of the synagogue. His response immediately, not to the servant, but to the father. He said, be not afraid. Only believe because faith came by hearing, but now fear is coming by hearing. He said, look, don't you be afraid. You declared it. You spoke it. You believed it. Now don't let what you're facing in the natural distract and cause doubt to rob you of the miracle that you believed you would receive. Be not afraid. Only believe. Or if I can interpret it this way, have faith. Have faith as you stand with me this morning. Have faith. Have faith. There is not one person in this house today that I do not believe that we have the ability to step forward and to declare in faith our ask of God. I don't believe there's not a one of us in this moment that does not have the faith, the inspiration, the empowerment, and the ability to step forward and declare and speak what you believe God can do. But I talked this morning to those of us that are facing hindrances, hurdles, challenges, difficulties. Those of us that have the courage and are brave enough to face that very obstacle and that very natural, practical element that is standing in the way of our faith expanding today. She's dead. She's not breathing. Don't bother coming. It's over. And Jesus said, just have faith. Hold on to what you declared because I'm here and I'm more than able to raise the dead. Can I tell you there is nothing that any of us are facing today that is more powerful than the faith you possess on the inside of you. Nothing. If you can ask it in faith, there is nothing that can resist the Savior of your soul from granting that request. And so I open up these altars today. Not for those of you that just believe that you can speak it, but for those of you that are able today, by the inspiration of God's word, faith has come into your heart. You have faith in this moment and you believe that no matter what you feel, no matter what you see, no matter what you hear, no matter what you face tomorrow, your faith is going to hold on because you believe that you receive it. It could be sickness. It could be finances. It could be relational. It could be job. It could be family. It could be a desire in your future. I don't care what you see right now. You don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of things. There are a lot of things that are going to come on this world that are going to cause our faith to stumble and stagger. There's a lot that's going to play out on the stage of this world that's going to cause our faith in God 
to somehow be challenged. But God is on that throne, and at the end of the book, He's still going to be on the throne. He is. One more, one more. I just want to tell you one more thing. I got to get this out today. If we believe that He's the author, if we believe in the beginning God, if we believe He's the author, we have got to have the same faith that He's the finisher. That same God that was seated on the throne in his sovereignty before there ever was anything you and I know about is the same God in the back of that book that's seated on that same throne. He never moved position and he never will in spite of all that unfolds on this world. That's why I'm telling you we're going to see a whole lot of things. But we've got to not ever let ourselves be deceived by what we see, by what plays out on the world stage. There's got to be something in us that is ever growing and ever expanding that is holding on with a death grip that God is God and I have faith in God have faith in God four words, the same four words in the beginning God they are counteractive they are simi- they're, 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 they're joined together those same four words that set it in place are the same four words that are going to save us hallelujah, come on right now right now, have faith have faith Have faith, Brother Ricky. Have faith. God's a healer. God's a provider. Have faith. Have faith, Sister Marsha. I know you've been through it. I know you've been sick this year. I know you're fighting. I know you're a woman of faith. Have faith, Sister Marsha. I know you're not feeling where you want to feel yet and seeing what you want to see yet. Have faith. Have faith, Sister Sherry. Have faith. It's been years. It's been years. But have faith. Have faith, have faith, have faith. Have faith, have faith. Have faith, Tamara, have faith, have faith. It's not always going to be like this. Have faith, have faith in the name of Jesus. Have faith, have faith, have faith. Have faith. Have faith, Brother Cali. Have faith. Have faith. In the name of Jesus. Have faith. Ha! Ah, don't let what your eyes see deceive you. Don't let your feelings and emotions overwhelm you. Have faith. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Have faith in the face of sickness. Have faith in the face of adversity. Have faith. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Our faith is so much more powerful than what we understand. Have faith. Have faith, Amanda. Have faith, Amanda. God's going to do something incredible. God's going to give you an excellent report. Have faith in the name of Jesus. Have faith, Brother Johnny Lambert. Have faith, Brother Johnny Lambert. Have faith. Hallelujah. Have faith. it sister Patsy have faith have faith hallelujah the sweet is coming out of the bitter sister Patsy there's going to be sweet come from the bitter have faith in the name of Jesus have faith have faith don't let what your eyes see today deceive you in believing God can't deliver tomorrow what is promised have faith In the name of Jesus, it's not happening on your time frame. It's not happening according to your plan. Have faith. You're growing impatient. Have faith. Doubts creeping in. Have faith. In the name of Jesus, keep walking. Keep believing. Keep trusting in Jesus' name. Your 